Good afternoon. I'm Dan Mogilev from the Campus Office of Communications and Public Affairs, and i um, super thrilled and honored to have our Chancellor, Carol Christ, with us uh, for this semester-ending campus conversation. So glad you could join us. Um, again, just to reiterate, there are index cards on your chairs. If you have a question now that you know you want to ask the Chancellor, great time to fill out the card, hold it up, be collected. But also, total, also totally fine to do that in the course of the conversation. And so without further ado, Carol, perhaps a few words about where we are and where we're headed. I'm delighted. Uh, so um, I, first of all, I wanted to start with a big thank you. Um, I think that Cal has the most talented, imaginative, dedicated staff in the world, and I am conscious every single day of all the work you do. So I want to thank all of you for the work you do. I was down at facilities this morning thanking them particularly for their work in the power outage, but just generally for all of the often unseen work that keeps this campus going. And so I want to thank all of you. Uh, begin with news. Um, the first is a little bit old news, but I don't think it can bear too much repeating, which is that the budget is balanced. Um, <laughs> we actually have a modest, very modest surplus of about $60, $60 million. Um, I should say, I, it doesn't sound modest to all of you, but in the context of our whole budget, it really is modest. <laughs> And, um, I, I, but I should say to all of you, the budget is precariously balanced. Um, that it depends, our future financial health depends so much on what the regions and what the state do. Uh, so first of all, we need a consensus um, among the regions and then with the legislature about what would be a reasonable set a reasonable philosophy of tuition increases. If our major revenue source never increases, that means from year to year, we have to make major cuts. And so that is perhaps my highest priority as a political issue is to um, make the case for modest, predictable, regular, tuition increases. The regents are going to consider at their January meeting a plan for cohort tuition. That means only new students coming in get a tuition increase and the tuition holds um, uh, the same for that cohort all through their years at, um, at uh, um, any of the UC campuses. The other thing that matters, of course, is the state's increasing um, its investment in the portion of our budget that comes from the state. So um, we got to a balanced budget about halfway through, um, uh, through cuts and through um, financial discipline and about halfway through growing revenue sources and um, our um, uh, increased diversification and multiplication of sources of revenue is becoming very robust and that's really exciting and very good for the campus. So other news, I wish I could be as cheerful about the capital side of our budget as I am about the operating side. Rosemary Ray, uh, the CFO, has said often, I'm absolutely confident I can solve Berkeley's operating budget problem. I cannot solve its capital budget problem. And just to lay out the different aspects of it, we have a $2 billion deferred maintenance backlog um, I'm sure you all know what that means. Um, and then we have recently reassessed the seismic condition of all the buildings on campus. Uh, they're rated one through seven, with seven being the worst and one being the best. The only good news is we have no sevens. But we have seven sixes, um, which is very poor, and we have over 65s. So that's a huge challenge for the campus with no clear revenue stream to do that seismic work. Uh, we also have gotten to a point where many of our laboratory buildings for STEM, um, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, are uh, not in um, the shape that they need to be for our research and frankly to compete for faculty with our private peers. So we have a real problem in the modernization of our laboratory. And then, of course, there's the huge issue 
of housing and how few of our students we house and how much a burden this is for our students who have to live in places that are too expensive, too crowded on the very impacted Berkeley, Oakland, El Cerrito um, uh, um, markets for rentals. So that's really a challenge. Let me tell you a little bit about what we're doing on the capital side. Uh, first of all, our housing projects are moving forward. We have a wonderful, wonderful donor-developed project. Its name is now Anchor House, and it indeed will be an anchor for our campus. It'll be right at the entrance to the campus on the corner of uh, um, University and Oxford. It will be for transfer students. It's such an exciting gift. We have another gift that is going to be made to the campus where someone is building us an apartment building for graduate students at Emeryville. And so that's also an incredibly, incredibly exciting development. In January at the Regents meeting, we're taking People's Park to the Regents. So um, that is moving ahead in um, the planning. And I think you all know it's going to be about a quarter of the site we'll use for permanent supportive housing for the homeless, a quarter of it for a commemorative park. Our own Walter Hood, who just recently won a MacArthur Genius Award, is going to be the, doing the park design and about half of it for housing. And then there are other things in the hopper too. So we're moving as fast as we can for housing. The one project that stalled is the Upper Hearst project, the one that's on the parking lot. Um, that's at the top of Hearst um, there because the city is uh, suing us um, about the supplemental um, environmental impact report that we had to do for that project. We cannot um, start construction on that project. So that's the housing piece of it. The um, campus piece of it is much, much more complicated. And I think of it as like a giant chess game or a kind of Rubik's cube we have to figure out how we can um, strengthen um, our buildings seismically. In other words, do the seismic retrofits, build whatever new facilities, modernize whatever buildings we need to build, and minimize the number of moves that individual um, units uh, 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 need to make. So the building that we've set our sights on as the number one seismic remediation project is Evans Hall. Um, that's one of our sixes. I don't think many tears will be shed for Evans. Um, uh, we, but what we have to do is, uh, the reason we chose Evans is it's a six, and it is the, in terms of occupancy, the biggest of our buildings that are our sixes. And so we have to figure out a place to put all the people and functions that are in Evans. So the first building we will build will be a building on what, what, what we're calling the Tolman site, but it obviously will have another meaning. That'll be a data science building. And then we will build at the same time a building that will have classrooms, um, uh, 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 the academic, uh, LNS advising, um, mathematics, and, and economics. And we haven't figured out, we're, we're contemplating what the, what the best site for that would be. And then when we do those two things, then we can take down Evans. We're not going to build a new Evans in its place. Um, we'll probably build two smaller buildings. But that's kind of where we're, where we're going in the most immediate future. We have some... The seismic ratings for the six buildings are, they mean all kinds of different things. For example, Moffat Library is a six. All it means is it has one pillar that needs reinforcement, and that's about a $10 million project. Not very expensive in the way those things go. Um, uh, you know, Durant is another six. It means the, 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 the stonework on the front isn't well enough attached to the building. So the, the, the seismic ratings mean a whole range of things from buildings that really have to be demolished like Evans and replaced to ones where the retrofit is pretty straightforward and relatively, I say relatively inexpensive. There is going to be a bond issue on the um, uh, state ballot at, um, for the primary election. That's extremely important for our capital planning. 
It's a $15 million bond issue. It's uh, 9 million for K-12 and 2 million each for the community college. Billion, billion, sorry. So you get used to doing away with the zeros. <laughs> It makes it all seem more manageable. <laughs> um, and uh, a, a, a um, billion, 15 billion, and two billion each for the community colleges, CSU and UC, and that money will be distributed among the UCs. Um, all of our projects, or many of our projects, will have complex funding arrangements. Uh, we will have a, a philanthropic element to many of our buildings. Um, a long-term debt element, now that our budget is balanced, we can take out modest amounts of debt once ag again, and a state funding component as well as a deferred maintenance component. So that's the kind of capital piece in, in short. Um, really, really exciting news is that we are about to launch uh, a campaign, the public phase of campaign in which we've been counting for now six years. Um, the kickoff is going to be on February 29th, 2020. I love it that it's a year, that, a day that comes once every four years. And um, our goal is going to be very ambitious for this campaign, probably $6 billion. And uh, we will expect to be halfway there by, time, by the time of a public kickoff. And you know, just keep your you know, ears open. We're going to have a lot of exciting announcements about, about gifts. And then finally, before we turn to Dan's questions and your questions, I want to talk a bit about diversity. This to me is one of the most important priorities I have. It is enormously complex to make progress on. Um, first, there's a demographic element, obviously. I think all of our campus populations, um, undergraduate student body, graduate student body, uh, faculty and staff, must become more diverse, and we're developing a strategy for each of those groups. So there's the demographic element. But then there's the experience that students have when they get here. And that is going to take the community to solve. I'm sure Dan will ask me questions about the um, really offensive video that was posted by a student and the way in which it is deeply pained and grieved uh, elements of our community, I think in large part because it rubs salt in the wound of um, the prejudice that some of our communities live with as part of their daily experience. So I'm going to be having a set of conversations over the spring semester about our responsibilities to our community and for our community. I think that particularly, and I said this in my campus message, in this world of easy, cheap, online communication, something offensive that somebody could say in a room, which somebody in the room can say something back and they can argue, um, it becomes, um, with the kind of digital universe we live in, something that's broadcast to millions of people and becomes viral very quickly. That's so much harder a problem to solve. And the consequences are so much less immediate to the individual who, who does it because they don't have to confront whoever is in the room with them who may not agree or may f with them or find what they've said deeply hurtful or offensive. But let me stop there, and I'm sure we'll talk more about this. Just for those of you in the back, there are a number of seats in the front. If yes, you want, don't be if afraid. If you want to come forward. Don't be afraid to sit in the front row. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Um, so I do want to follow up a little bit of, about the video. Uh, almost since the very beginning of your tenure, you've talked about the importance you place on the sense of community mm -hmm. and a sense of belonging. Those. From my time when I was in college, I don't remember that being a priority, and I don't remember that being a value that anybody, I think, paid a lot of attention to. Why is it so important for you, and how does it connect and support the academic, connect to and support the academic yeah. mission? That's such an interesting question, Dan, and I, I, I think in part, um, Berkeley is a lot bigger now than it used to be, 30% bigger since 2008. And um, that means it's an even more jostly place 
than it used to be. In addition, it's a much more diverse campus, I think all to the good, um, uh, than the campus that I joined in 1970. Um, and that means that people come here with very different experiences, different identities, different beliefs about the world, and these can clash both you know, in classrooms, in um, the social kinds of contexts, or online. And then um, Berkeley has become something of a target as well. I mean, Berkeley is one of the few campuses in the United States where you can make the claim that history is happening here. And that makes it a really attractive stage for people to come to and make whatever claim they want to make where they think they can get the headline because it's, uh, it's at, at Berkeley. So one of the things that we say we're teaching our students, and I think this goes for any college and university, you're, you're teaching students how to be in a community. And that, you, you probably, most of you know, I was at Smith College, very different place, rural environment, you know, um, uh, about 2,900 students. Um, it's a very different thing, building community at a small place than a big place that's like a city where there are a lot of neighborhoods. And so trying to figure out how to do that, how to make each of our communities, and each person in our community feel valued, feel as if they belong here, seems to me so important. And it's also extraordinarily difficult. Uh, I can talk, I can put on programs, but finally, I'm not capable of creating a community for the 50 or 60,000 people who make Berkeley their workplace or the place that they study. So it's something that's on all of us um, to try to figure out how we can make our community a place everyone really values being in and feels valued being in. It also feels, I'm wondering if it feels to you a little bit at the moment, a little Sisyphean, the whole sort of quest, given what's going on in the world beyond campus, the era of polarization and anger. We're moving into a national election period. We just had a conservative speaker on campus. Many of those who wanted to attend were subject to extraordinary verbal abuse and physical harassment. What are your concerns and thoughts as we move into what might even be a, a period of even more sort of heightened tension and friction? I, I think we're in a, in a state, I mean, this is hardly an original thought, we're, but we're in a moment right now, nationally, politically, it's probably worldwide, in which people are really testing norms. So kinds of things you wouldn't think that you would be able to say, people are now saying, trying to say. And the fact that the online space is so unaccountable, um, it's held so unaccountable, makes it easier. And we are at this moment of both intense polarization, the fact that we're a stage, and the fact that this is a time of testing. We're, this, it's going to be a trying time, I think, for our campus. And people's feelings, many of them are extremely raw and hurt. Um, I, I, didn't want to talk very much about the video itself because I think that the 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 it's it, it really was just an occasion for something that's way deeper than um, some very um, misconceived hurtful uh, individual students act. But the, the the student talked specifically about blacks, about um, about uh, gay people, and about women, and. I had many conversations with members of the black community saying how much this pained them, how, how much it hurt them, how much it made them feel they didn't belong here. And I've also had conversations, which I really regret I didn't, didn't, um, I didn't say anything about this, um, in the message from gay people who felt, this is obliterating my existence. It is not recognizing me. It also took out after women, and I, I've been thinking a lot why I just thought this is some silly, incredibly misconceived um, uh, young man's drunken rant. Why didn't it affect me? 
And I, because I'm older and I'm secure and I'm powerful and I'm white, am free to say, it doesn't matter to me. And it doesn't. But that's not true of people who feel that they exist in a marginalized position. And somebody is saying, you don't matter. You don't count. You don't deserve to exist in this community. I just have one more question on this front. We'll move on to other subjects and the questions that have come in from the audience. One of the things you and I talked about when we were preparing for our conversation today, you talked about this perceived gap between our stated values and our actions. Mm -hmm. Can you unpack that a little bit and maybe share some thoughts about how to close that gap? Is it through conversation or are there other things you're thinking about? Yeah, that's a wonderful question because I think all the time about how we're so, I talk all the time about how diversity is one of our central values. We're proud of our diversity at Berkeley. Um, but um, that whole, um, that aspiration is immediately seems hollow when we have any of a number of incidents, not just this one, that happen on the campus and people live, particularly people who are members of underrepresented groups, live with a sense of contradiction that we're not what our words are asserting we aspire to be. And that's a huge challenge for the campus. In part, this is numbers. Um, the uh, black students are only 3% of our undergraduate population. When I came to Berkeley as a faculty member in 1970, women were 3% of the faculty. I know what it feels like to be 3%. You feel like there are not very many people like you. And, um, and so that, the numbers are really a problem. Um, um, but it's also how we all create community that's, that's an issue. Understood. We're going to move into your questions now and again. If Things occur to you, things you want to ask in the course of the conversation. The cards remain on your chair. Fill them out. Hold them up. So the first question, what are we going to do with the $60 million? <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid it's probably already spent. I mean, there are so many priorities that we have. Um, uh, we're uh, enormously understaffed in LNS advising, and I should say this isn't 60 million continuing dollars. It's 60 million one-time dollars. Um, I, we have law, the legal expenses all the time. We have emergencies that happen like the power outages. Um, so I, it's, it really is, even though it sounds like a lot to any human being, it um, maybe except for Bill Gates or somebody, it's just a drop in the bucket in terms of our expenses. Which reminds me, we're sort of, I, I don't know exactly how many months we're into the, you know, a new um, regime in Sacramento. What's your sense about where we are in terms of the possibility of additional state funding? What's the university's relationship like with this governor right now? Uh, I, uh, the, the, this governor, uh, unlike the previous governor, doesn't uh, badmouth the university, and we're very grateful for that. He also is really ambitious um, for many things, and I'm not sure the university is as high as some other things are on his list of priorities, but we have been really working the legislature. There was a quite wonderful meeting that John Perez, who is the new chair of the Board of Regents, um, uh, put together with uh, Dana Half in San Diego, which he invited some leaders from the legislature, three chancellors, and I was one of the three that was invited, as well as a few regents. And we really had a meeting of the minds. And so I think that it's not just the governor, it's really the legislature mm -hmm. too, and changing the conversation with the legislature. Me. Uh, next question, is there any long-range plan to build more classrooms, especially large classrooms? Absolutely. <laughs> there goes uh, the 60 million. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, the, the building that we will build as half of the replacement for Evans will have many classrooms in it, so will the replacement to Tolman. Um, I was just talking with the dean of the College of Natural Resources this morning. Um, Wellman is one of the... Um, uh, the, the, the number sixes um, on our uh, seismic list, and he was talking about his plans for renovation of Wellman and putting, restoring what used to be a 200-seat um, amphitheater lecture room to that building. So we're very, very aware. There's another really interesting plan to try to create another performance space um, for um, Cal performances, that would be a classroom when it's not being used for performances. So we're very, very 
focused on in all our building projects. Indeed, we've uh, um, uh, uh, identified it as a principle. There's no building project that will move forward that we won't put classrooms in. So it was a few weeks ago you created a little stir when you opined on the SAT. <laughs> yes. Um, blew up Twitter there for the afternoon. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, you know, casting some doubt about whether that should be part of the process. And now you unpack that a little bit too. But the question here from the audience is, can you speak to how you came to your recommendation to do away with the SAT in the application process? Yeah, I certainly can. I, I, um, when I was uh, the provost here in the 90s when uh, first the regents passed SP1 and SP2, which prohibited, um, among other things, uh, any um, uh, um, use of gender, race, or ethnicity in admissions, and then that later became enshrined in uh, um, uh, Proposition 209 on the state level. And I um, saw at that point how um, the uh, SAT um, really exaggerated the kind of, um, of, uh, of, of, of um, re real drop in diversity um, that, the, uh, that, that the University of California experienced at that point. You may, some of you may remember that Richard Atkinson, who was the president at that point, did a lot of study of the SAT. Pat Hayashi, who used to work on this campus, was one of his really important partners in that study. And um, what the, the, those, these studies show, which have continued to this day, there's someone who works in our Center for Studies in Higher Education called Saul Geiser, who's continued to do these studies. And the most, um, the, 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 the most important correlative with SAT scores is um, wealth. Uh, and even when you strip out all the other correlatives, there's a kind of racial correlative that you can't strip away. Um, you all know, I'm sure, about all the SAT prep resources that are available to parents who can pay. Um, and um, so I believe that the SAT does not create a level playing field um, for our students in their applications to the, to the university. When I was president of Smith, I uh, did away with the SAT as a requirement for application. And uh, we um, subsequently experienced a much larger, more diverse applicant pool and a much more diverse student body. And our admissions office didn't feel themselves in any way hampered in making judgments about the academic qualifications of, um, of the applicants to Smith. So I experienced what it means to make to go SAT optional and, and think it's a good thing to do. And so what's going on with the UC? Is there some sort of study group? Yeah, there's we... a study. Um, there's the, you probably know that admissions are in the um, hands of the faculty. Uh, so there is a group that is uh, uh, studying the issue right now in the system-wide academic senate. It's going to make a recommendation um, fairly early in the new year, February or March, and then the regents will act on that recommendation. So staying with the admissions subject, this question uh, also from the audience. The University of Texas system recruits a diverse student body by giving admission to all Texas public high school students in the top 10% to the UT system. Those in the top 7% uh, are granted admission to the flagship UT Austin campus. Is this a model the UC system or Berkeley could follow? What concrete steps is Berkeley taking to make the student body look more like the diverse population of California? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it, it, in fact, we've done a lot of studying uh, of this, and um, it doesn't have the diversifying effect on our population that it had on the University of Texas, in part because we're not as... When you say it, what are you referring to? The, the, the top 10%, ah. the top 7%, in part because we're not as um, racially and ethnically segregated as, um, mm. as Texas uh, is. Um, I just actually met with the director of admissions yesterday asking that very question, what are we doing? Um, and we're looking really, really carefully at um, very diverse high schools um, that are uh, particularly in our immediate neighborhood like Oakland, Richmond, Berkeley, 
um, and looking at those applicants really carefully. We are redoubling our outreach efforts and will redouble our yield efforts to those um, schools. Um, I'm really delighted to say that there's been a very substantial increase in the diversity of our transfer pool of applicants this year, though the um, freshman applicants are pretty much the same in terms of diversity as, as last year. But I think this is going to be a multiple year project in which we have to work not only on our outreach and yield, but also on the culture that students experience when they come here. I know you're gonna be also sending out a talk, stay saying with admissions for a second, there's gonna be a campus message soon about some changes in how applications are read. Um, if you could talk about that a little bit and what, what do you say to counter those who fear the university's looking to end run Proposition 209? Um, so talk a little bit about those two things. Okay, well first of all, we made a new, I mean, apologize for this being kind of down in the weeds. We, um, it used to be when uh, the readers would read applications, the first thing they would see is the SAT score. We're now putting that at the bottom of the application and um, doing the profile stuff at the top. Um, uh, we used to ask readers to say yes, no, maybe. Now we're saying recommend, do not recommend, partially you know, recommend. So we're trying to change things about the reading process that will um, uh, um, make the readers um, or uh, encourage the readers to take a more holistic hmm. view uh, so, like challenges a student may have faced. Yes, face, that's exactly. What, mm -hmm. You know, characteristics of the high school mm -hmm. rather than right up front the numbers, which okay. is the way the um, the reading process used to work. And um, we've changed the training of the readers, but we do not um, the, uh, take into account uh, race or ethnicity or gender. We can't. It's against the law. Understood. Um, Staying with another complicated subject, this one is, can you comment on implications for Berkeley regarding the administration, uh, the Trump administration's declaration um, that, uh, regarding anti-Semitism, that federal funds will be withheld from schools that don't provide, that don't confront anti-Semitism. This was done under what's called Title VI. Title VI uh, offers protections for people based on race, ethnicity, um, and, I, for, and nationality, and there was concern in the Jewish community. On one hand, parts of the Jewish community were seemed pleased the administration is taking a stand against anti-Semitism. Others concerned that it facilitates othering by suggesting that Jews are a nation apart. So what's, what's, what was your reaction to it, and do you think it's going to have an impact here on campus? Um, I, uh, I don't think it's going to have much of an impact here on campus. I, there's been a lot of debate in the press about the contradiction between this presidential order and the presidential order um, to colleges and universities a little while ago, again, threatening federal funding, um, uh, taking away federal funding on um, and supporting academic freedom. These are in contradiction with each other. Um, that uh, that um, if you say, I mean, the, I mean, this again gets way down in the weeds, but um, if you take the definition that the presidential order has of anti-Semitism, it would mean that anti-Israel statements are part of what is seen as anti-Semitic, yet um, you're certainly allowed to be critical of Israeli politics um, or um, uh, support a Palestinian state or Palestinian liberation and free speech. Indeed, uh, I, it's one of the things that I say often to students and upsets them is you can say a lot of really abhorrent things and they're protected by, by the, the, the First Amendment. So it's not clear, I mean, I, as with many things that the president is doing, it seems to be more motivated by um, a political goal than one that is actually good for colleges and universities. But I actually don't think it's going to be um, uh, have much of an impact here. Okay, moving into a different area. I'm always blown away by the full range of issues that you need, <laughs> <laughs> that you need to weigh in on. So now we're gonna come back down to the ground level. Uh -huh. The question is, is the, prob is the housing problem severe enough that the campus is willing to engage in public conversations regarding student affairs, and here they're referring to the division of student affairs, student affairs reliance on housing revenue to support its programs rather than maintain existing uh, infrastructure or build new buildings. 
Yeah, I think that's a really important question, and indeed it's a conversation we've been having privately. And, um, and one of the things that is absolutely wonderful about the, um, these donor gifts we're getting for housing is that they will subsidize the cost of housing and enable us to make housing more affordable. We're also pursuing other philanthropic gifts in regard to housing. Um, another one, next, thanks for being here. I understand you recently shared the Berkeley staff report on staff baby bonding leave with the UC Council of Chancellors. Mm -hmm. How did they respond and what are the next steps? Any sense of when we might see a policy change? Uh, the, uh, all the other chancellors, I'm glad to say, were completely supportive, as was the president. She said, get this done to the uh, person who was the uh, head of HR who was in the room. And so I know it went to the vice chancellors for administration at their last meeting, which I think was either yesterday or the day before yesterday. And we're moving through that. Uh, there are a number of different ways to do this. What would be most preferable, there's currently, as many people may know, a state law that stipulates um, that uh, all um, uh, state agencies as well as private organizations have to give um, a family leave and baby bonding leave. Um, but because the University of California is uh, constitutionally independent, it doesn't apply to the University of California, so we're going to need some kind of amendment to that state law to include the University of California. That's, as I understand it now, that's the route that um, the Office of the President wants to take. And I just don't know how long that's all gonna take. Got it. We're gonna stay in the HR world here, and the question is, some of us are forced to use vacation days during curtailment, and some are not. Why not give us all the days off? <laughs> I, I actually think that's a great idea. Um, I, uh, speaking as someone who has to use her vacation days. <laughs> powerful, but not that powerful. Um, I, I, I think the, I, I'm certainly willing to, to take that issue up. I think the complexity of it is that some people really do have to work over, um, the, that, that our campus, let's backtrack a little bit. When I was at Smith, Smith really closed over vacation. It was completely closed, you couldn't do anything. Berkeley never really closes. And so I, I guess that you know there would be an equity issue you'd have to sort out, maybe you just add to vacation days. I actually think it's a good idea, but, um, but I haven't had this conversation with anybody, so I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I'm told often <laughs> that when I think something is a good idea that it isn't. <laughs> Sticking with the sort of same uh, general subject, as the question is, as our student population grows, how do you plan to prioritize staff growth, especially in the student services side where students of concern, conflicts among student populations, demand uh, more time to resolve? I, I think student um, staff growth uh, in student-facing staff has to be prioritized. I, we're under-invested, I believe, in advising staff, where uh, clearly there's, a, there's an uh, increasing demand for more counselors at the Tang Center and just student-facing staff. I mean, it's not reasonable to think. I mean, one of the things that I'm very concerned with, sorry, restarting, is that we have grown our student body, as I said before, by 30%, we have not grown our faculty. So too many students can't get classes, can't get required classes. We really need to grow the faculty and we have to grow the student-facing staff. What are the plans on growing the faculty? Is that part of the campaign? Where are we that's, uh, that's part of the campaign. In fact, I should have said my opening remarks, what the goals of the campaign are, not just the new um, money goal, but, the, but the, um, the, the, the project goals. We want to add at least 100 faculty. We are, um, uh, graduate student support is um, a very important goal for the campaign because we are now no longer competitive with our private peers for our graduate student support packages and um, undergraduate uh, scholarships and the kinds of programs that will enable students both to navigate this very complex place better, um, but also make sure that students who are on financial aid don't miss out on the kinds of um, 
life-transforming experiences like doing research with a faculty member or having internships that uh, really lead to future opportunities. So um, those are, are some of the campaign priorities. Got it. Um, staying with money here, uh, is any additional funding or support being provided to retention centers on campus? And I cannot read the last word. I, they gave an example of a retention center. I'm not even sure what a retention center is, if you could perhaps uh, explain Well, there, there are all of them. There are many programs. They're not a single program, but all of the programs, like EOP, for example, that provide resources, or the Student Learning Center, that provide resources and counseling for students that um, help them thrive at Berkeley. We just got a wonderful, wonderful grant from the Haas Jr. Um, a foundation of $10 million. A lot of that is going to retention um, efforts. We got another grant from the Correct Foundation. Some of that is going to be used for retention connected efforts. I'm just curious, you were talking about fundraising at different points throughout the conversation. What's the main narrative when you meet with somebody who's potentially a very significant donor and they're interested and they want to know what's going on with Berkeley? Where is the head? What's sort of, what are the, what's the, what are the high points of what you convey, what you want them to understand? Um, uh, what I talk about is very much what I've talked about here. I talk about my aspirations for the campus. I try to get them to understand um, the um, lack of equity of experience of our students. I talk about our great needs for facilities and science and engineering. Many people think that fundraising is like going in with a shopping list or going to an ATM. And that's really not the case, that it's a conversation. And people who have enormous capacity and inclination to give think of the um, gifts that they give as their legacy in the world, and they have to be deeply meaningful to them. So it's not as if I go in and ask, I want funding for LNS advising. It's really a conversation in which I try to understand what's important to you about Berkeley. What do you want to see for this university that you value so much? And then we try to find a meeting of the minds of, um, of uh, things that meet the donor's aspirations and things that the university indeed um, you know, fit with the university's aspirations. Got it. Um, let's see. So here's first a thank you for uh, Unix Unlimited courses in 2020. And this is what staff yes. can. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. And I want to say how that arose, which <laughs> is uh, I've been having a set of lunches at the uh, chancellor's house for the um, elected union representatives. And we, of course, can't talk about collective bargaining issues. But we've been talking about their experience of working on the campus and things they'd like to see. And this suggestion came from a lunch when we were talking about UNEX courses. And I remember a woman talking so eloquently, saying, now we're only allowed to take courses that relate to our work and can increase our expertise of whatever her job is. She said. I'm a janitor. There aren't any courses about being a janitor. And I would love to take courses that would increase my, you know, the, the capacities that I have that would enable me to do a different kind of job. And we really took this seriously. Another suggestion that came out of that lunch was uh, ESL classes um, for, um, for employees who, um, are, um, where, who where English is a second language. So um, we got some really good suggestions. So I want to give credit to uh, the employees who thought of this idea. And then the, the, the same person had a follow-up, which is uh, asking if tuition reimbursement will be offered for staff if the classes or master programs are taken outside UC Berkeley. I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, I, that was, I, when I was at Smith, the, I think the most valued benefit we offered our employees. You got half tuition for your kids no matter where they went. Um, but I don't think that's going to, I don't think that's going to happen here. What I hope, I have a meeting actually later this week about this. I really hope that we're going to create a system-wide program whereby um, employees who have not finished their bachelor's degrees can finish their bachelor's degrees while they work. 
Um, back to money and infrastructure. Are the seismic costs we need to address part of the $2 billion in deferred maintenance, or is that an addition? No, it's in addition. The number that uh, Rose keeps quoting as our capital need is $13 billion. Yikes, that, that's a big number. We that is agree. a big number, <laughs> that is a big number. Two billion is two. So, <laughs> you know, and speaking about budget reminds me of something else, you know, for many years, and for people who've been on campus for a while, there have been issues with the athletics budget, and um, I know that was a priority for you and the athletic director. Where, where are we, that? is there an agreement? Do you feel where the program has now been set on a financially sustainable course. Can you update us? Yes, uh, the athletics budget is balanced in addition to the campus's budget. So I want to explain what that means because um, for years, for decades, athletics has been running a deficit, um, a deficit in excess of, of uh, $10 million, um, extending to $20 million in more recent years. And um, every year, the campus would pay that deficit. So it wasn't as if it was a deficit, like if you run a deficit, you know, it accumulates and you ultimately, like on your credit card, you ultimately have to pay it plus interest. This deficit was one that the campus paid for every year. So one of the things that I realized was that um, we were actually budgeting athletics at a much larger figure than was the putative campus contribution, which was $5 million. And I realized that the campus had not been being honest with itself. That if it wanted an athletic program of the size, scope, and ambition of our current athletic program, it simply cost more in terms of a campus contribution to run that program than we were admitting to ourselves a cost, even though we were in fact budgeting it at that level because we were, you know, um, buying, we were paying for the deficit year by year. So Jim and I had lots and lots of meetings, and um, we have agreed on an athletics budget with an increasing set, a set of uh, a set of increasing both revenue and philanthropic targets. Um, ultimately, in about four or five years, um, we're um, coming down to a campus contribution of thirteen point three million dollars a year, which to give you a kind of, of sense of scale in the athletics budget, that's about the size of the financial aid for our athletes that's in our athletic budget. So you can think of us, the campus is paying the equivalent of the financial aid that we offer our athletes. And just to ask the obvious, it feels like these are costs that you believe to be commensurate with the benefits that accrue to the campus and yes. its community. I do. I, I, I've been thinking a lot. I was not a big athletics fan before I, I became chancellor. And um, the, the um, but I've been so moved by, there aren't a lot of opportunities in our lives to feel part of a group with which you identify. And um, games are one of those places where you do. Mm. And I think it really has a, 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 an important community building virtue the most important thing about athletics is the opportunities it gives our students to compete at an extraordinarily high level of excellence across a broad range of sports. And I've become convinced that it really is a front porch for many of our donors who don't give, certainly exclusively, or even sometimes principally to athletics, but athletics is the way they come together with the campus. So it's very important to our philanthropy, not philanthropy to just athletics, philanthropy to the campus more generally. So before we started, you suggested I might ask you about the big game, but I didn't notice what color t uh, turtle oh, you're wearing. This is, uh, <laughs> this is one of the few days uh, in the year when you're allowed to wear red. I'm so sad, I love red, and I have lots of red clothes in my wardrobe. I studiously avoid them most of the year. But I tell you, there are three times when you can wear red, just to give you all permission. You can um, wear it at around Christmas time, you can wear it at Chinese New Year's and on Valentine's Day. <laughs> Those are the, the red exemptions. <laughs> Okay, I won't ask about the big game then. Um, no, but the axe is on campus. Uh, there you go. It just, it I won't say where, though. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have time for just a few more. We'll try to get to them. So this one is, the world seems, quote, STEM crazy these days. What is Berkeley doing to help the liberal arts and the humanities survive and thrive? 
I, 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 I want to say that one of Berkeley's great, um, uh, great distinctions is its strength across the board in its academic programs. There is not a, 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 a problem that's important to the future of the state, the country, and the world in which the humanities and the social sciences are not important partners in solving. Um, take CRISPR. Um, so um, obviously, you know, very intensive um, uh, STEM um, technology set of discoveries, um, but the policies that apply to its use, the ethics of its use, those are questions for humanists, for philosophers. Um, climate change, obviously STEM intensive area, but how you get people to change their behavior, how do you get governments to change their behavior, what are good public policies, those are um, really social science kinds of topics and humanist topics. So I, I think Berkeley has a competitive edge because of the strength of its social sciences and humanities. Um, the uh, um, data science initiative, on, which is so important for the campus, is as important to the social sciences as it is to the STEM disciplines. Um, it's also important to the humanities, but probably not as central as it is to social sciences, because the humanities don't work as fully with data. Um, I, I have to tell a funny story. Um, uh, so there was a wonderful faculty member in English when I first arrived here named Josephine Miles. And she, her research was all about word frequency. And she had armies of students who would page their books counting words. And now, you know, that kind of research is actually an important kind of research in the humanities, word frequency, but it, they don't have students turning pages and counting words anymore. So I'm going to bundle up the last couple of questions, but uh, you may not know it. I think you have a family member in the audience because this card says, why are you so amazing? <laughs> And do you sleep was the second part. I do, I do. I read a book that changed my life, and I want to tell all of you to read it over the holidays. It's Why, you, Why We Sleep by Matthew oh, yeah. Walker, and it talks about how important sleep is. I tell students this all the time. Sleep eight hours a night, and you should all do too, and I try to. All right, so I'm going to bundle these together, but and I okay. think you'll get the general thr <laughs> thrust here, and just if you could sort of riff on the general idea. Three separate questions, but they're really all touching the same thing. What has been the most difficult decision you've made in 2019? Oh. What outcome are you most proud of in 2019? And then a separate question said, you've been in leadership roles for a long time. What new lessons have you learned about successful leadership in your role as chancellor? And I think these are all sort of asking just to weigh in a step back for a second. It's, it's a hell of a hard, complex job. And, you know, what have you learned and, you know, what are the, what are the things you most feel most proud about having tackled or maybe most wary about in the future? Oh, gosh, that's such a huge question. It is. Um, that I, one of the things I've learned is that you have to gather a really good team around you and um, make them responsible and accountable for the things you care about. These jobs are huge and no one person can... Um, uh, do it all. I've also learned the importance of decisiveness, that often the perfect is the enemy of the good, and making a decision with reasonable promptness and efficiency, even if it's not the perfect decision, enables you to move forward. Uh, I think the things that I'm proudest of in, um, oh, that's such a complicated question, um, I'm really so thrilled with some of the philanthropic gifts mm. that we've gotten. I don't think of those as decisions, really, but they certainly have been relationships that have come to just extraordinary, um, extraordinary actions, and those are really wonderful. Some of the toughest decisions I make are ones I can't discuss in this forum because mm. they have to do with um, personnel mm. issues, or um, so. Th those are. Those are um, 
And, and there was a third question, and well, I'm I, forgetting it. I forget too, but I'll ask, is, is it fun being chancellor? I mean, do you wake up and say, I can't wait to go to work, or is it like, oh, another day drinking from the fire hose? <laughs> Every day when I get in my car, I say to myself what my father used to say when he left for work, another day, another dollar. <laughs> <laughs> I, there are things that are enormously, um, there, there are things that are enormous fun in being chancellor. They're more important to me, there are things that are enormously gratifying to me. When you are talking to someone who is gonna give an extraordinary gift to the campus, and is so thrilled about this gift and what it's going to accomplish. That is mm. an incredible mm. thrill. Or when you see something moving forward that you care deeply about, that's an enormous thrill. I mean, there are certain daily days when I come home and I think, oh, why did I didn't do this job? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know those days. Um, <laughs> So before we wrap up, I have one more card I actually wanted to read. Um, our, the next campus conversation is January, January 21, and we'll be joined here by our men and women's basketball coaches, both of whom are new to campus and really, really interesting people. I'm going to read the last card, which isn't a question, but I'm going to go out on a limb because I think it may capture what a lot of us think and feel. It says, thank you for this series of talks and question and answer. I feel I'm more a part of the campus and enjoy getting to know some of the people helping to steer this big ship. Thanks to everyone. And I also want to say particularly thanks to LaDon Duval, who yeah. helps put these together and takes care of all of it. And, and I also just want to thank uh, you, Chancellor Chris, once again for your time and generosity thank you. here. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.